At the end of our service today, we'll be, at the end of the message, we'll be taking communion together. I hope you received communion elements. Otherwise, you can, uh, when we get close to that moment, you can go back and get one at the back. But we, we believe that God, who has started relationship with us, that his purposes also extend into our relationships with each other. And as today we look at the most famous friendship in the Bible, uh, the friendship between Jonathan and David, um, I, I, want, I want you to think about your closer friends, your, your closer friends, and how you can deepen those relationships or perhaps find closer friends. Loneliness is, is pretty common in our culture today, and it's possible you're sitting here and you, you really don't know someone you could name as a close friend, but God wants to put you on that journey. Just as a starting point, then, let's take a glimpse at Jonathan and, and David and how they felt about each other. First Samuel, chapter 18, way back in the Old Testament, it says in verse 1, after David had finished talking with Saul, Saul was the king, Jonathan, who is Saul's son, Prince Jonathan, became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. This is a, a way of speaking of deep friendship, kind of like we would say, Jonathan found a soulmate in David. And after Jonathan is later killed in a battle, David grieves over the loss of his friend Jonathan this way in 2 Samuel 1, verse 25. How the mighty have fallen in battle. David had huge admiration and respect for his friend Jonathan. The mighty have fallen. What, what, a, what, a, what a man he was. And he says, I grieve for you, Jonathan, my brother, for you were very dear to me. So these, these important friendships fit in a, usually a larger mosaic or, or list of kinds of friendships we have in our lives. And Gordon MacDonald, many years ago, in his book, Restoring Your Spiritual Passion, he, he itemized the five kinds of people we generally have in our lives. And first of all, he talked about the, those resourceful, those very resourceful people we have. This would be a smaller number of people in our lives. They would be our key influencers, our key mentors, possibly teachers that really affected the direction of your life, or pastors. These are the very resourceful people. And then the very important people. These are literally the VIPs in our lives. And the very important people are like our peers. These would be the people without whom we couldn't do what we do. They, they, they would be possibly, if you're married, your spouse. They would be the people you go to work with. They could be uh, uh, the other students in your study groups who help you do your homework. They, they could be um, any, any number of people that... that that are in your life, you really couldn't do what you do without them, and, and they're these extremely important people, VIPs. And then there's the v, what he calls the VTPs, the VTPs, the very teachable people. And, and these are the people that we invest in. Um, maybe if you're a teacher, they're your students, or if you lead a small group, they're the people in your small group, or the person you're mentoring. These are the people we invest in. And then all of us, and he said this would be the largest number of people, we, we all have very... We just call them very good people. They're not like, they don't particularly influence us. They're not people we're teaching. You know, we could do without them. They just show up at parties. They're just good people. They don't have any particular vision or drive or passion in life. They're, they just kind of populate our lives. And they're good people and they're nice. And then he says, obviously, all of us also have those VNPs, those very needy people in our lives. And uh, they're, they're the people call us at 10 o'clock at night because they've got to talk. And they just, uh, the, the people sometimes need our financial help or the, the people who are just lonely and they need somebody to walk with them. These are the very neat, needy people in our lives. And he says we have all five in our lives. But the title of his book was Restoring Your Spiritual Passion. This is one of the reasons friendships are so important to God because, because they affect who you are. You often hear me quote Jim Rowan that, our lives are sort of the sum total of the five people we spend the most time with. And you want to be spending time with people who energize your spiritual walk and restore your spiritual passion, as he titled his book. And he said the first three of those will restore your spiritual passion, the first three, uh, even the teachable people, because it's energizing to watch people grow and respond. And the last two groups, they will tend to deplete your spiritual passion 
good people, not because they do anything wrong, but they don't do much, period. They don't do anything for us. They you know, take our time sometimes, and, you know, they're there. There's nothing wrong with them, but there's nothing great about them either. They're just nice people. And then, of course, the needy people tend to drain us. And, and he says, you, it's like you should have all five. You just need to make sure that most of us have the bottom two in our lives, but you've got to make sure the top three are there as well, at least some of the top three, because your life needs energizing, your spiritual passion needs to be kept alive, and is deeply affected, and whether you can accomplish what God wants you is deeply affected by the people who are around you. This is why your friendships are so important. And as we come to David and Jonathan, we are coming to, of those five, which ones would, would they be? They'd be number two. They'd be the VIPs, those very important people. These are two peers. These are two people who develop a deep bond of friendship and a great partnership. And so the question, the question comes as we look at their friendship is, how can we develop those important, life-giving friendships in our own lives? And they'll, they'll give us a few clues as we just walk, watch what they do. And, and the first is that they had some things in common. I think we're going to build deeper friendships Let's start with the obvious. Um, you look, you, you don't just focus on how different everybody is. And I can have a bit of a critical bent sometimes and, and just when I see people just immediately, the first thing I think is how different they are than I am. But at some point, you got to focus on what you have in common, like common interests, common activities, common location, just what do you have in common? Now, it is true, psychologists will tell us, it is true that opposites attract. And this is a very important dynamic in a romantic relationship. And, and they can, opposites continue to keep relationships interesting, but you can't be so opposite that in the long run, you have nothing in common. And it's not just that you have interests in common, but you, at some point you have to have needs in common. So it's okay to be attracted to an opposite, but at some point if your relationship is going to be last, lasting, you've got to have some at least needs in common that, that, that make true companionship possible with that friend. And, and so you do this. Now, now this sort of was the starting place for Jonathan and David. Um, they had one thing especially in common, in addition to both being young guys, um, they, they, they had this guy by the name of Saul, <laughs> and he was the king. Jonathan was his son, Prince Jonathan, and David was like sort of Saul's adopted son. He was a military hero. He'd become a hero. And so like right there in 1 Samuel 18, verse 2, after talking about this friendship they had, from that day Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And so they all lived in the same place. Proximity is where you start. I mean, some of you, some of you, you know, it's just like, like it, it could be, you know, someone from high, my high school who's also in our youth group and I keep running into them. Or it may be somebody who just, you know, I keep running into them at Walmart and I I keep running into them at Andes, and anybody who likes Andes could possibly be a friend of mine. That's something pretty good in common. And uh, someone, or, or somebody, you know, every time I come to church, I just always run into them in the lobby. I mean, maybe this is it. Or, or even making intentional decisions. We have between 40 and 50 small groups in our church life and congregation. And, and, and maybe you say, well, I keep running into this person, and I heard they're in a group. Maybe I could join their group. And, and you need to place yourself somewhere, first of all. And they had proximity in common. They just were together. And they had that in common. They were both young guys. And, uh, and, and yet they began to discover that they had this heart and this passion that was also common. And if you're going to, like, be joined, if you're going to have a, like, like a soul partner, if you're, you're going to have truly close friends, there are going to be you're going to find yourself sharing passions. So there's two stories, the first of which, the second of which is very famous, the first of which is actually my favorite story in the Old Testament. And uh, the heart of it you can find in 1 Samuel 14. We don't even know if Jonathan has met David yet. But in 1 Samuel 14, Israel's under attack by the Philistines. The Philistines owned 
the monopoly on the ironworking industry. So at this moment, there were only two swords in Israel. King Saul had one of them, and, King, and Prince Jonathan had the other. And Saul's sitting under a tree somewhere, and he's doing nothing. And so his son Jonathan says, somebody's got to do about, for the sake of Israel and for the sake of the glory of our God, this is unacceptable. So verse 6 of 1 Samuel 14, Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, come, let's go over to the outposts of those uncircumcised men. Perhaps, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving whether by many or by few. Now, if I was armor bearer, I would have been going, uh, now, Jonathan, I'm loyal to you, but please tell me you did not just say, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. I mean, you, me, one sword, and that whole army. And we're going to attack them all by ourselves, right? This is what you're saying, right? And you're saying, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. Please tell me you have a word from God on this. And Jonathan said, I don't have a word from God. I don't know exactly whether we'll live to see the end of this day. All I know is that our limitations don't limit a great God. That's the only thing I know for sure. And so he's not going to sit around for the sake of the glory of God. He's going to go for it. And he and his armor bearer with one sword attack an entire Philistine army and win with the help of the Lord. Three chapters later, here comes another guy. His name's David. David comes from the shepherd fields around Jerusalem, where he's been a, around Bethlehem, where he's been a shepherd, and he comes and he comes to the front in another war with the Philistines. And his two brothers are there in the army. He visits them, brings them food, and he notices that there's a stalemate in this battle because the champion of the Philistines, a giant by the name of Goliath, is defying the armies of. of of Israel and saying, I'll take anybody on and uh, winner takes all. If I beat your guy, then we get everything and we win this war. And nobody wants to face the giant except, guess who? David. David goes out to him, chapter 17, verse 45. And we don't know if David's met Jonathan yet, but in that same spirit, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. And I'm sure David was also thinking, and that's a pretty big sword and spear you have. But I come against you, short and relatively unarmed as I am. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, who you've defied. And this, like rose up in Jonathan, this holy anger rises up in, against anyone that would defy the living God and he brings this giant down and wins an incredible victory. David and Goliath, wow. And it's right after that story that, that David and Jonathan, because David now gets connected to Saul, and he apparently meets Jonathan in, in two hearts that have so much in common are melted together in deep friendship. You can understand this. Two young warriors with unbelievable faith and great courage and a zeal for the glory of God. In fact, this suggests to me another pathway for perhaps finding your best friends. And, and, and I would put it this way. Go after God's calling on your life and see who falls into step with you. See who gets your spirit. And sometimes we make like an idolatry out of friendship. I've seen people sit around, well, I'm not going to volunteer for anything because I haven't found any friends in this church and all that. And I understand that you should find friends here or wherever you are. But sometimes we make this idolatry of friendship like, like my friends become even before my allegiance to Jesus and obedience to him. And, and you just need, I, I found, this is probably been the pathway for me because I'm, I'm a bit of a quiet guy. I went to college and I was a nerd and you know I'm still a little uncomfortable in parties even though thank you for inviting me to your parties and you know, I'm just kind of this way I'm not this most relational guy and I but you know what I found a a guy I graduated from high school with um, he loved engin engineering like me he was a mechanical engineer I was an aerospace engineer meaning student and and we went to the same college our first two years 
in, in pre-engineering, and we transferred together to the University of Minnesota to study engineering, and we actually roommates, lived in the dorms. Now, he was not a Christian, so I didn't have anything in common spiritually with him. I wish I did, but I, I didn't. But he was a wonderful guy, and we, we had a lot, because he was mechanical, I was aero, we'd have a lot of classes together. And uh, I love the fact that I was poor, it was the early 70s, I still used a slide rule. But his dad, who had some money, had bought him a, had bought him a four-function calculator by Texas Instruments. It was that thick. And it could multiply, divide, add, and subtract. That's all it could do. You know, in, in 2022 dollars, it was probably 500 bucks to buy something that could electronically add and subtract. But boy, did I love doing my homework with him. Because he just helped me crunch those numbers really fast. And, and we became just dear and great friends. And the common interest of science and engineering kept us together and gave me an opportunity to share with him about the Lord. When he graduated with his bachelor's, he went into the automotive industry as an engineer, and I stayed at the University of Minnesota to go to grad school. And we lost touch, but, but just a few years ago, after probably um, 35 or 40 years, he looked me up on social media, found me, and he just wrote me, he didn't say much, he just said, oh, I see what you're doing, what you always loved. I see you're doing what you always loved, which was ministry, not engineering, because uh, I shared the Lord with him, and, but we had just this deep friendship, and, and so, it, you know, common interests do forge friendships, but then once I got in graduate school, I was leading this little Bible study that uh, went down to three. It was with Chi Alpha. We have some of our national Chi Alpha leadership here, yeah, um, and uh, and we went down to three, went back up to 12. And during my second year of grad school, a story I've often told, we saw this supernatural spiritual breakthrough. One night, I don't know how it happened. It was miraculous. I can't account for this in any human way. And all of a sudden, 65 students showed up that night, and it grew from there. And that's probably ultimately why, because of that night, that I, I did go in the ministry direction, vocationally. And that night, a guy came. I'd never met him before. He was one of those, that extra 50 students that came out of nowhere. He was an architecture major. I was an engineering major. And, uh, and he just had a heart for God. And he loved to pray, kind of like I love to pray. And we, we met each other that night, and that night of that breakthrough. And he came back the next week, and we started getting to know each other. We used to love, and we built this deep friendship that was built around just having the same heart. And and we would pray, sometimes in my dorm room, sometimes I'd go to his place, sometimes we just try to find somewhere we could be alone, and we just, we'd pray in funny ways. We'd pace back and forth and pray out loud in the spirit, and we'd just call out to God, like out loud, and the two of us, we must have been just amusing to watch. But I found a soulmate. I found somebody with the same heart I had just to seek God. I found somebody, even though he's an architecture major and he's carrying a heavy load at school, he was hungry for God. And you know what? You, but I didn't wait. I didn't wait to be hungry for God till I could find somebody who'd be hungry for God with me. I mean, you go after God. You go after His calling on your life. You volunteer somebody somewhere, whether you know people there or not yet, and then watch who falls into into line with you. And that's how you find soulmates in part. And so, so my friend and I, the two of us, several years later, ended up actually together birthing a university church that's still there 40 years later. Unfortunately, my friend and I, after that church started, had a falling out. And it was really painful. And next week, we're going to look at a New Testament friendship between two men of God that that fell apart in a very painful way. I'm going to talk about how you walk through that. I wish I knew some of that back then. I don't think I handled it really well. And soulmates aren't necessarily impervious to misplaced expectations and hurt feelings. You've got to be realistic about this. That's why I'm grateful my relationship with Jesus trumps every other relationship. And he's a refuge. Because sometimes these things go south in very sour ways. And we do all we can to prevent that. But the fact is, we're going to get to that next week. The fact is, David and Jonathan found each other. Two heroes with a passion for God. And so, 
And so it says in 1 Samuel 18, verse 1, once again, after David had finished talking with Saul, that's because he had just killed Goliath. So it's right after these two hero stories that Jonathan became one in spirit with David and who loved him. Jonathan had already taken on the Philistines all by himself. Now he watches David do that. And they fell into step, these two men, who had the same heart to go after God. And then they stayed loyal to each other, especially when it wasn't easy. And that's the other thing. That's, this is where we're going to land. That's the last thing I'd say to you in terms of going, that we see from this friendship, in terms of building those important life-giving relationships in each other. Each other. We're, we're getting pretty fickle in our culture with friendships. Someone says something sort of hurts our feelings and we're out of there. But whatever happened to good old-fashioned loyalty? Loyalty. And this just gets tested. You know, this ability to stay loyal and have each other's backs. I mean, this gets tested because although Saul the king had called David in to live with him and his son Jonathan, so that was pretty good for Jonathan and David's friendship, but what happens is Saul turns on David and actually starts, he becomes so, in, it says, demonic power took over him in a rage against David because David was picked as the next king. And, and, and he became enraged and jealous and actually tried to kill David. And at first it wasn't successful, so then Saul decided, follow me, Saul decided to play Jonathan against David. And he lies to Jonathan so that Jonathan would pass on to David what we would know as today as fake news. To throw David off and then to make Jonathan have to choose between his loyalty to someone, his father who's trying to kill his best friend or his best friend. And it gets tense. And in fact, there's one point in the story in the next couple of chapters where David's almost thrown back on his heels and saying, Turns out what you told me before, Jonathan wasn't right. And Jonathan's going, no, my dad lied to me. I'm so sorry. And, and, and David's kind of going, I don't know who I can trust anymore. I thought we were loyal friends. And, and, but it was that Saul was playing Jonathan against David and it was beginning to bring this rift. And Jonathan re-pledges his loyalty, even though his dad was trying to kill this guy. He re-pledges his loyalty to David. And it was a follow-through of something that happened when Jonathan and David first met each other. First met each other. And it's right here. It's right here in, um, in verse 4. And Jonathan made a covenant. Would you say that word out loud with me? Covenant. Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. He just said two verses earlier that they sort of became soulmates. And Jonathan does an unusual thing. He took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword and his bow and his belt. Like what on earth is going there? on there? Well, in these times in the ancient world, it was common for people to pledge their loyalty to one another with a covenant. And a covenant would mean just more than saying I'm loyal. You would bind yourself to loyalty at personal consequence to yourself if you became disloyal. And here, here's a brief summary of what a covenant ceremony would have looked like in the time of David and Jonathan. Five things. There'd be an exchange, and this is where it starts. They exchange clothing and weapons. There'd be some kind of exchange. And then an oath, like I promise to stay loyal to you. And then there'd be a ratification of that covenant. Often it was a ratified in blood in those days. It might have been the antecedent to the modern handshake, but they'd kind of slit just by the bottom of their palms and they'd, they'd, they'd 
touch and their blood would mingle. And it was kind of like, like my blood will be shed if I don't keep this covenant. And then there'd be always a symbol of the covenant. When God made a covenant with Noah, it was the rainbow. When God made a covenant with Abraham, it was circumcision. But they would have some kind of sign and then a celebratory meal. That was common in Old Testament covenant ceremonies. There's an echo of that in modern culture. Does that remind you of anything that sort of endured into modern culture? That's a marriage, exactly. It's a wedding. It's a wedding where they come together and, and, uh, and there is a covenant, there's vows, there's a ratification as the, as the witnesses sign the marriage license. There's, there's a sign, that's the ring. There's a meal, that's the reception. That would be kind of a distant echo of an Old Testament covenant of loyalty. And, and, and it's that first part, that exchange right there, that exchange. Where, read it again. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic, even his sword, his bow, and his belt. And what he was doing was saying, uh, first of all, the tunic. The tunic was something that it's not like I was like, I have five different coats lying in my closet, you know. Your tunic usually would be the one thing you would always wear on the outside. And people could identify you at as a distance, from a distance. And usually it had, usually it kind of became somewhat synonymous with your identity. It's the, it's the tunic you wore. And so, and so he was saying to Jonathan, he said, I'm, I'm willing to identify with you. I'm willing to identify with you. Um, what I have is yours. If my tunic represents my possessions, but if it also represents my identity, I'm going to entrust to you my reputation, and you can trust me with your reputation. This is partly loyalty and friendship, isn't it? That we have each other's backs and we can trust. So loyalty means when somebody is gossiping to you about one of your friends. You, you, you may just want to politely respond by saying, um, no, that person's my friend, and that does sound out of character for them. You, you're not going to just throw your friends under the bus just, just so you can make somebody who's gossiping happy and like you. you. You're loyal to people, unless they prove that you just, that they can't be trusted, and sometimes it comes to that, but um, until that moment, you're going to give people the benefit of the doubt. You're going to stay loyal to them. You're, you're going to protect their identity. You're going to protect their reputation. You're, you're going to try to redirect when people start trashing their reputation behind their back. This is loyalty. This is staying with them. And also, it, they exchange weapons. And, and that one's a little easier to understand. They're saying, if I'm your friend, then your enemies are my enemies. And you can trust me to have your back. I'll defend you. I'll be there for you. It's a powerful, wonderful thing, this idea of friendship. And they're going to have to do this. David and Jonathan will have this covenant. It'll be later that Saul starts trying to play Jonathan against David. And it causes a potential rift in the relationship between David and Jonathan. But Jonathan had made a covenant. And Jonathan had not forgotten it. In fact, I looked up loyalty this past week. I wanna, I'm going to look at that word. And, you know, if you Google the word loyalty, you'll be shocked, or maybe you won't be. But I was surprised how many dog stories I came up. It's like, right? Man's best friend. And what a sad thing when the most loyal other thing in your life is your dog. Some people commiserate, it's all they have, their dog. My dog will always be loyal to me. What a thing for somebody who is living out covenant. Not that you would want to go through a covenant ceremony with anybody but you, the one you'd marry. But what a wonderful thing to have loyal people in your lives. Remember Lord of the Rings? Frodo has taken the ring that has such power could absolutely corrupt a human being. And he's got to get rid of that ring and destroy it in the dark and evil land of Mordor. And so he's on this journey which is fraught with danger. But he's got his best friend, Sam, with him. Samwise Gamgee, good old Sam. 
and a few other friends, and together they're called the Fellowship of the Ring. And partway through the journey, they've had so many close brushes with death, so much as resisting this mission that Frodo is on, that, that Frodo decides, I can't, I can't put my friends in this position any longer. And so he decides to slip away from them when they're not looking. Because he said, I've got to finish this journey alone. I can't endanger my friends any longer. So he steps into a boat and launches out into a river. Some of you may remember that scene in the movie. And all of a sudden, the next thing you see, crashing through the branches down the hill towards the river shore, is Sam. Is Samwise Gamgee. He's calling out, Frodo, Frodo, where are you going? And Frodo's going, uh, Sam, stay away. In fact, literally, Frodo says, go back, Sam. I'm going to Mordor alone. And Sam's not deterred. He continues towards Frodo, this time splashing in the river, and the problem is he can't swim. He doesn't like water, and he can't swim. And he gets up to his waist, and he says, of course you're going to Mordor, and I'm going with you. And then he goes, and then Sam tries to get closer to the boat, which is getting farther and farther from shore. And pretty soon he's in over his head. And Sam just starts splashing and gasping and, 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 and sinking underneath the murky surface of that water. And finally Frodo reaches down his hand and grabs Sam's wrist. He pulls him up into the boat. And Frodo, Frodo looks at Sam as if to say, why? Like, why would you risk your life attempting to swim out to me? And Sam soaking wet sits to that book and looks at boat and looks at his friend Frodo in the eyes. And he said, I made a promise, Mr. Frodo. I said, don't ever leave him, Samwise Gamgee. Don't ever leave him. And I don't mean to. I don't mean to ever leave you. So Frodo looks at him and smiles and said, okay, come on. What a thing to have friends who won't leave us. I've had a lot of people say to me, I thought I knew who my friends were until I got really sick. Or until I lost my job and my income was gone. Or until, um, until all these bad things started to happen in my life. And I became, the, remember that fifth person in our lives, the very needy person? He said, and all of a sudden, the people I thought were my friends disappeared. And I found out who my real friends were. Every friendship worth its salt is going to be tested with loyalty. When it's not to your friend's advantage to stay loyal to you, or it's not to your benefit to stay loyal to them. And it takes time, and it costs money to make fees meals and deliver it to their homes. But I watch the way you, so many of you come around one another. I watch groups and classes that come around people who are sick and can't get out and you develop meal trains for them. I happen to know, I don't really see what people give, but once in a while I hear of people giving very large amounts of money to somebody else in the church who is just going through a horrible time, have insurmountable medical bills to pay or other things. Why? Because we're family, because we're friends, because this isn't what just I get out of this, but we're loyal to one another. And, and this is the beauty of friendship. This is the beauty of the family of God. This is the beauty of being together. I made a promise to myself, Samwise Ganji said, uh, never leave that guy alone. And so I'm not. And that's the friendship, that's the covenant that Jesus made with us. In fact, covenant is the Jesus way. It is the Jesus way. Paul would say the night before Jesus was betrayed, I pass on to you what the Lord I received from him that the night before he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you, not for me, for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also after supper, he took the cup. He said, this cup is the 
new covenant, right? There it is, covenant, covenant. It's a new covenant in my blood, ratified with my own life, my own blood. I'll not go back on my word to forgive you, to heal you, to strengthen you, to make you mine if you come to me. He made a covenant with us. This isn't God just laying rules on us and, stay, and staying, saying shape up and behave, otherwise I'll hit you. No, this is a God who came into covenant with you and me. We could have a relationship with him. And even when your own friends do betray you, he will not. Because he made a covenant sealed in blood. And so he said, this is a cup, the new blood. He said, he said and I want you to do, whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. When Jesus died on that cross, he made a covenant of loyalty to you and me. And covenant's the way he does things. Loyalty is the fragrance of the kingdom of God. Being bound in heart with the Lord. And then finding people to come into pace with. Not everybody's our close friend, but God wants, for every season in your life, I believe he gives us key relationships that nourish and energize that season and keep reinvigorating our spiritual passion. And we believe God can do that in our lives. Do you agree with that? I'd like you to bow your heads with me, close your eyes. Father, thank you for this day where we worship you and hear your word and sing your praises and we were amazed again at this idea that you have made a covenant with us when you died on the cross. I just pray, Lord, for any of us who don't know you right now that we'll start there. We pray for covenant life to come to us. You shed your blood to make us yours, to purchase us for yourself, to wash away our sin, to be bigger than the devil in us. You came to defeat his power, to make us new, and to join our hearts with you. And so, Lord, if we're running from you, if we're playing games with you, forgive us. You know all the mess in our lives. Forgive us. Come into our lives. Make us new. In Jesus' name. Make us new. We receive you. We say yes to what you've already done on your side of the covenant for us. And then, Lord, some of us know you, but we're pretty lonely right now. We don't have a lot of friends. I pray, God, that you would... Um, you would really help us. Help us to stay, take the step to proc, put ourselves in proximity. Maybe to reach out to somebody we keep running into or maybe joining a group. Or, Lord, I pray that you just help us to, to be in proximity to some people that we, we really can find some things in common with. And Lord, especially help us, Help us not to use the lack of friends as an excuse not to go after you and your calling on our lives. Lord, and, and as we just obey you, as we just serve you, I pray that people of like heart will come into pace with us. And that like you did with Jonathan and David, you'll take these, you took those two young men and of like heart and join them together. We pray in Jesus' name that you do the same in our lives. And, for all of us in our friendships, whether it be our marriage or anything else, our roommates, whatever. We pray you'll help us to be loyal. Help us to protect the reputation of others. Help us to give a help us to give them our cloak and our weapons and, and say and say, I, I'm watching out for you. And you can trust me to have your back. I pray God you'll help us to do this. All these things we've talked about in your word. We just pray into our lives right now by faith. Then I'd like to invite you to take the cup and bread that you received, and would you just stand with me? We stand in reverence to our King and the Lord who loved us so amazingly. I'd like you to tear off the top part that has the bread. And Jesus broke bread as he would be broken so that we could be healed. This amazing God met us not when we impressed him, but in our brokenness. And... Um, He, he heals us and he renews us. 
So, Lord, we thank you for doing this for us. And we take the bread with gratefulness and we remember what you did for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you take the bread? Thank you for what you did for us, Lord. Thank you we're healed by your brokenness, your wounds. Thank you. Your body broken. Sacrificing yourself in our place. Thank you. And peel off the top of the cup. Lord, we thank you for... You said this is the new covenant in your blood. The covenant was ratified. And it was in your blood. Thank you. That means nothing can reverse it. We thank you we can be forgiven and clean today as we put our faith in what you did for us at the cross and receive your forgiveness. Thank you. Help us in turn to forgive people around us. Help us to be the friends we need to be to others, no matter what it costs us. And thank you for the forgiveness you've given to us. In Jesus' name. Let's take the cup. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I'd like to prayer partners, if you would come. Praise the Lord. We have an amazing friendship with Jesus. It started with what he did. And at every service, we always open up. If you want to even come and just kneel at, this, at the front steps and just spend some time seeking God, you're welcome to do that. But we have prayer partners here. And if you'd like someone to pray with you about starting a relationship with Jesus or, so, or about maybe friendships in your life or healing, whatever it be, uh, before we dismiss after this song, um, we invite you to come. We're going to sing a song as I don't think we've ever sung here before, but it just celebrates what the love of God for us and what we have just done when we took the bread and the cup. So I think you'll catch on to it pretty quickly. And let's just sing and worship and declare the truth of what God's done for us. And if you'd like prayer, feel free to come forward. Taste now.
Just lift praise to him. Thank you, Lord, for communion with you, for life with you. Thank you for the covenant you made with us. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. Thank you. Thank you for your cleansing, your renewing. Thank you for your guidance that we don't walk alone as we leave this place today. We walk with you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This is communion, life with you. Thank you, Lord, your grace, your triumph. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great God. It's been wonderful to worship with you today. And uh, it's a long weekend. We trust you enjoy the holiday weekend. Good to see you. My friend, the Girdlers are here today. Uh, Joe is superintendent of the Kentucky District, the Sons of God. Good friend. Renee, awesome to see you and your family. Bless you. Good to be together please feel free to linger. The worship team will continue to lead in worship. People still to pray with if you'd like or visit with one another. But God bless you. As you go, may you go in the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and go in the fellowship of His Holy Spirit. Amen.